What the fuck is up? This video is Noah's video, but he is on vacation on a trip right now and we needed to preface the video, which is phenomenal piece of content between Graham and Noah, two of the best young gifted minds when it comes to evaluating running back prospects. However, Noah's still a little unseasoned to the content game. Whatever he did, he fucked up the audio. So I just wanted to let y'all know that we're aware the audio is shitty. You don't have to comment it and let us know. We actually debated whether or not to even put this piece of content up to begin with, but we said, listen, work hard on the content, put a lot of energy into it. So y'all can decide whether or not you want to listen to it. It's a little bit choppy. It's a little bit submarine-ish. We did our best to try to improve it, but it is what it be. We're aware. You're aware. I hope y'all enjoy the content. <laughs> Um, let me bring Graham on right here. There we go. Graham, how's it going, man? Yo, what's going on? Good to be with you, man. Uh, it's good to talk some ball. We got some post-draft takes. I don't know about you. I've been firing in the best ball streets. It's a, it's a good time. It's on here. Yes, yes, it is. Um, I guess we'll just kind of jump right into it. Um, I'm familiar with Yards Created. I don't know that everybody's familiar with Yards Created. Can you just kind of describe um, what is it um, kind of in your own words? Sure. Yeah, so Yards Create is a charting process that I started seven years ago now, where basically every January, February, I just sit down and watch six to seven games of the top 12, 15 running backs coming in, uh, coming to the NFL, coming out of college. And, and basically, I'm watching every single play. Uh, Yards Create, the, the, how you get to the number is basically – what happens after the offensive line hasn't done its job? And the way I kind of describe it, no, is like it's like second level yards. So when the back gets into the second level and past the offensive line, what happens? Uh, I chart Mistaka's force. Uh, I kind of go into the nitty gritty with it too in terms of like Mistaka's force through elusiveness, through speed and power, and kind of split those out and kind of give a better representation of how the back is actually forcing those missed tackles. Um, I'm also charting every single passing down play that they're on to, uh, so pass down snaps, um, a route run, pass blocking, uh, route type, uh, depth of target. So it's a full charting process where basically it's just we're just trying to give a better encapsulation of, of uh, how the running back wins, where he wins, and then you know just trying to transfer it for, for everybody, just trying to transfer it to some fantasy goodness. I guess one question I have about yards created is is when you first had this idea, was it born out of like, I'm a data guy looking for a better way to understand running backs and so I'll like look to the film for that? Or was it, I'm a film guy and I want to kind of anchor my my takeaways in data and so I'm going to chart the film? Like where, which angle were you starting at? Definitely from the data perspective. Um, I've, I've just background for me like, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing now, I'd probably be in accounting. Uh, I was a finance and accounting major. Uh, so I was really good in Excel and, uh, and all of that, and, and loved football, obviously. And I remember reading uh, and DMing with Matt Harmon, um, uh, you know, when he came out with Reception Perception, and I was like, dude, what do you think this would look like for, for running backs? And kind of like bounced ideas off each other. And I was really like the nexus. Honestly, you know, I picked up all of my kind of film eye from reading, you know, Bill Walsh books. Honestly, I picked up Football for Dummies. This was like 2015. Trying to trying to learn the film side of things better because I'd always watch football. My dad played football. My granddad was drafted by the Saints. Like, you know, football had kind of always been in my family, but I didn't truly know how to watch it in a way that, you know, you're, it's different just like watching the Patriots play. Yeah, I just try to like blend the data side of my brain to like crunching numbers into like, how can I uh, take what we see on the field and convert it, you know, better in, try to make it more translatable because you know we've all read the scouting reports on running backs like oh this guy goes down on first contact or uh this guy's not laterally elusive but there's no there was there, it's gotten much much better of course but back 2015 2016 uh there was really no data attached to that there was no like tangible thing like hey i'm pointing to this and here's why right um, that was that was kind of the nexus for it is you know kind of a couple pronged things but Really, mainly, it's like, you know, back then, and even now, you know, it's just the analysis is like, hey, this guy is, you know, doesn't really create much beyond the, what the offensive line uh, blocks. Okay, that's a fine statement, but how, how do we actually uh, explain that? How, how do we make that tangible? How do we make that actionable? 
uh, for just not only ourselves and our analysis, but just for, uh, for, for readers or anybody who wants to just learn about backs and, and the game of football. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the things that uh, makes running back evaluation or maybe just player evaluation difficult in general is that especially at this point in like the the story of the NFL I guess like everybody is so good like especially guys who touch the ball that every year guys come out and you're gonna find some Twitter thread on every single player in the draft class like look at this guy's contact balance he's so fast but those people aren't necessarily wrong but everybody has good contact balance and everybody is fast and so it's good to I I think to to chart those things, ground your takes in in data, especially when they're kind of historically backed, and you have multiple years now of um, yards created data. And and one thing that um, one one question that I get about my analysis is like, are these things predictive of fantasy points at the next level? Are these things predictive of themselves at the next level? Is that even the goal? And so I'll kind of. Um, ask those things of you and yards created. Like, is is that the goal here? Is that yards created, you know, translates itself into fantasy production, or are you just trying to gain an understanding of how these players play? Yeah, the f- when I first started this, um, you know, there's a big difference between trying to find a metric that's descriptive and predictive. Yards created is a very descriptive metric. It just describes what happened on the field. Of course, it's subjective. It's subjective to my eye, but everything when you're chart, pretty much everything when you're charting football, um, is subjective. Even yards after the catch can be subjective. Um, you know, there's very few things that happen on the football field that is not a subjective thing. So, you know, from the onset, I was just trying to better, kind of just better give, uh, give a better uh, encapsulation of just running back scouting in general back then. But I have found that you know, yards created is is definitely predictive for fantasy success. I actually did a study last year and I put it up on fantasypoints.com. Uh, it's a free read where I just looked at, you know, what correlates best to fantasy points, future career fantasy points. Yards credit was at the top. It was better than rushing yards per game. Uh, it was better than yards per carry. Uh, it beat the combine significantly. Uh, if anybody's ever looked into or studied how the combine actually predicts future success, uh, they know it's extremely <laughs> Yeah. Extremely yeah, but um, yeah, I, you know, I've, I've been pleasantly surprised with how well Yards Created has done uh, in terms of predicting future success. But by no means did I uh, go at, go at it from that angle f- uh, from the onset. I really, it's still it's still just a descriptive stat that happens to to be a pretty good indicator. Not obviously not perfect by any means, uh, but a pretty good indicator of future future success. Hell yeah. Yeah, I think it's one thing to kind of, uh, you know, collect a bunch of inputs and like train a model on, on you know, just what's going to spit out the highest R squared. But, you know, that gives a lot of confirmation to your eye as like a film evaluator even and, and just kind of, um, you know, the process that you've developed. So, so that's good. Um, let's get into some rookie takes. Um, probably the most controversial running back in this class, um, at least leading up to the combine, was Isaiah Spiller. Um I know a lot of people had him as RB1, maybe RB2 right there with uh, Brees Hall. Um, Kind of the metrics that I like to look at indicated that he was far from that, that he was like a historically inefficient runner at Texas A&M. Where do you stand on Isaiah Spiller just kind of as a runner? Yeah, I lean more towards what you just said, that he's pretty inefficient. Um, I've been really surprised by the Spiller discourse myself. Um, yeah, just going through my, my database, which you can get on, on fantasy points, um, Spiller was in the third percentile all time in yards created per attempt. Uh, he scored pretty poorly in terms of missed tackles for us per attempt too. Um, and, and, you know, look, I mean, he went to the combine, didn't do any of the running, uh, he didn't do any of the 40, but he did the jump drills and was, you know, bottom 20th percentile of jumping drills. And he ran like a four, six, three, I want to say this as pro day, which really translated to like a four, seven. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he played slow on tape. Um, I, I think he has really good contact balance, and he's extremely competitive. But he has to be extremely competitive through contact because he's not that good of an athlete. You know, the, there's a there's a lot of nuance. You know, I see a lot of you know people quoting yards after contact as a great running back stat, and it is. But to a certain extent, like honestly, I want backs that avoid contact. Like, yeah. I don't know if it's a good thing to be good through and after contact like not only you're getting hit more you're also probably not creating more yards you know if you can't make a guy miss in the second level you got to go through 
And more, more likely than not, especially at the NFL level, you're going to get taken now. Um, you know, to be honest with you, you know, I think, you know, the Chargers have now taken a day three back in three of the last four years, maybe four of the last five. Uh, I, I think Spiller is the best of that group talent wise, but that's still, you know, we're still talking about a role for him where he's just not going to get, you know, just kind of translating this forward. He's not going to get those high value touches, you know, at least for the next two years while Eckler is under contract. You know, those, those passing down targets and a lot of those goal line carries, 75, 80% of it is going to go to Eckler. So I, I really don't know outside of an injury to Eckler, a long-term injury to Eckler. I don't, I don't really see a lot of long-term value for Spiller here. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I'm, I'm right there with you. And Eckler has even been good in short yardage the last couple of years. I think people are, are assuming that Spiller is going to be like the short yardage guy. Um, this, this wasn't on the sheet, but do you have a, do you have a comp for us for Isaiah Spiller? You know, not one that comes to mind. I'm, I'm not, um, I, I'm always the type that, like, if I have a comp that comes to mind while I'm watching him, that I'm more than happy to, like, you know, put that in writing and put it out there. I don't, I don't yeah. have a comp for Spiller. But your point on Eckler, you know, the thing we always kept coming back to, to Eckler with is, like, are they going to let him score touchdowns? And they finally did. Like, the staff last year finally let him score touchdowns and, and get some burn in short yardage. And he was great in that role. I see no reason for them to go away from that. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe it's Spiller. Maybe it's another guy. Is there is there a guy in this class, let's say other than Spiller, who you just kind of don't understand the hype about? Samir White was one. And I think that the hype has kind of calmed down on him for sure. Um, but Zamir White is in the zeroth, zero, 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 whatever, whatever zeroth <laughs> you want to talk about. He's in the zeroth percentile uh, of yards created. He's dead last out of like 85 runners in my database in yards created per attempt. Uh, he was really, really bad in terms of missed tackles, force per attempt. To me, he was just a product of that offensive line. And, you know, it, it's unfortunate. He popped his ACL. Uh, in back-to-back years at separate knees in 16 and 17 or maybe 17 and 18 out of high school. Uh, and I think it just kind of showed, like, you know, he just doesn't have a ton of bursts left on the field. Maybe he can regain some of that. Uh, but the Zamir White, at least in the pre-draft process, was one guy that, that you know, I think you know, some people were kind of hyping up, and I, I really couldn't make sense of that. Yeah, I, I feel you there as well. Um, what about vice versa? Who's a guy in this class who you like? Um, who you don't really understand why he's not getting more buzz than he is. Well, to be honest with you, this class is, uh, I, I don't want to say it's like, it's not the worst class I've charted. I, I, I don't think it's that depth wise. Uh, I think 2019 might have been a little worse depth wise, but maybe not even. Um, yeah, 2019 was that Montgomery Miles Sanders class. This, this, yeah. you know what I'll just say? This is the class depth wise that I've seen in the seven years that I'm doing. Uh, one guy I liked more, and he got the draft capital, was Brian Robinson pre draft. I, 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 you know, I kind of felt like he was, you know, we, we've, all, we've all been on the Bama backs for however many years, and, and Robinson had to kind of wait to get his turn behind you know, Najee Harris. But uh, I came away pretty impressed with with Robinson. Um, obviously, he benefited from an awesome offensive line, but he was fourth in this class in this type of sports per attempt. So you know when you know, it, obviously, you know it's one of the best stats that we, we have uh, to kind of not decouple um, running back performance from offensive line play. But this type of sports is is in my opinion the best one. Um, Robinson scored well in that. I think he's a good pass for, uh, pass blocker. And he was a pretty good receiver. He's not explosive in the same way that Rashad White or James Cook is, um, but he, you know, he's got good enough hands. Uh, that Robinson pick for Washington, spinning a top 100 pick on him when you've got Antonio Gibson there as another bigger back, man. I, I think it's a, a direct shot across the bow of, of Gibson for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, it seems that they just don't view him as a a traditional like three down running back maybe not even a pure running back and so you know mckissick back robinson there just just sounds like bad news um Brees hall i'm kind of you know post combine especially everybody's been all over Brees hall he was the first running back taken in the draft um he's getting like jonathan taylor comps i've seen herschel walker comps do you do you view him as having like any weaknesses really as a pure runner um, as a receiver, what do you what do you view as the holes in Brees Hall's game, if any? Yeah, so I'm the type that I always like to start with the positives. Um, I mean, Brees Hall is obviously a phenomenal athlete. He wins with power, speed, elusiveness. He he's got all those calling cards in his bag. 
But in my opinion, just watching however, you know, 150 carries from last year, for the type of athlete that Brees is and as quick and twitchy as he is, I, I think he struggled with his processing and vision. Um, there was a few too many plays where he either towed the line between being patient and overly hesitant, and that is a very, very thin line. Uh, in my opinion, he was overly hesitant, and he got away with it because, one, he's an incredible athlete, and two, you know, it's a kind of a level of competition type of thing. Um, you know, for a player of his caliber, I would love to see Brees see the hole and hit it and just go. And I think that's what, in New York, that's what they're going to teach him. That's what that run game is all about. It's a, it's a zone run game. You get one cut, you get upfield, and you explode. And I think Brees, once he gets more reps, uh, I, I think he's certainly got the physical, uh, you know, God-gifted ability to, to, to really take off at the next level. But, you know, I never understood the JT, Zeke comps either. I, you know, those guys, in my opinion, were like blue chip, really nothing wrong with them prospects like if you're trying to find a hole in their games like you're really going out of your way to find a hole with Brees, I, I think you have a little bit of concern with the processing and vision um i don't think that's it's it's up to those guys level but by no means is is Brees, uh you know a bad prospect by any means he's a very very good prospect but i just don't think he's in that upper elite echelon of you know JT Zeke, not even Najee Harris. I thought Najee Harris was a elite prospect. Okay, so where where kind of would you put him um, among recent backs? Like, is he like a Cam Akers level guy? Um, I don't know how you felt about Travis Etienne, Javante Williams. Um, yeah, I would put him closer to like the Cam Akers, J.K. Dobbins type of level, Clyde edwards alaire like really really good players who got really good draft capital, but. You know they're not can't miss you know jt level prospects um yeah in, in that kind of group and like um i love josh jacobs in uh, 2019 uh, i think in just terms of overall projection like you knew exactly what you're getting with josh jacobs i thought he was a much better i thought jacobs was a much better receiver coming out i thought he'd be getting way more work than that, yeah that aspect but i think Brees and josh jacobs if you want to make like just not they're not similar players in the way they win, but just in terms of like overall confidence of how I feel about them projecting them forward, I think that'd be that'd be pretty a pretty good start for you. Okay, um, let's let's pivot to to Kenneth Walker. Um, Kenneth Walker is a guy who I think pretty much everybody is in agreement. I'm in agreement that he is probably the best pure runner in this class. Um, it's hard to find flaws in his game as. A runner. Um, there are the the pass catching concerns, maybe some size concerns. Um, do you see flaws in his game as a runner? And how do you? Where do you stand on this whole? How should we feel about him as a receiver thing? Sure. Yeah. Kenneth Walker smash yards created uh, easily number one in this class in yards created per attempt. He's actually ninety second percentile all time. Um, that top. Let's see. Top eight is Joe Mixon. Uh, Darrell Henderson, Kenyon Drake, Saquon Barkley, Ezekiel Elliott, Anthony McFarlane, Womp Womp, and <laughs> Kenneth Walker, uh, and yards created per attempt. So pretty, you know, outside of McFarlane and maybe Drake, pretty good grouping to be a part of there. Uh, he led this class in this type of sports per attempt by a mile too. Uh, I think it's a great fit, man. We know what Pete wants to do down in Seattle, for better or worse. They want to run the ball. Rashad Penny's on a one-year deal, and Look, Rashad Penny, when he's been healthy, has been awesome. But that's been the big thing, when he's been healthy. Um, I, I'm tired on the landing spot, and I think consensus. Um, just in terms of rookie ranks, I I had Walker RB1 pre-draft. I flipped it since. I, I think just with Brees and the, the landing spot, uh, his passing down potential, I, I have Brees at RB1. And I always said pre-draft, too. Like uh, You could have I, – I have no problem having Brees at RB1 because – we're about to talk about Kenneth Walker's receiving is, is definitely a question mark. You know, we've seen plenty of backs come into the NFL with very little receiving production do well. Uh, and we've also seen the flip side too. It's really, truly a, a coin flip type of situation, especially in Seattle, man. I'm curious to get your thoughts on this. It's like, they don't throw to the backs. You know, that's just not a part of their offense. Um, I, I hope, I hope they kind of reverse course with Kenneth Walker, but you know, it's, it's not like this is a situation where you know, we've got like a Clyde Edwards Alaire type of prospect where it's like, okay, you're drafting him for his passing. Right. Complete opposite. 
so I'm not extremely hopeful that that's going to be, you know, a big part of this game moving forward. Yeah, I, I I actually just released a video going through all these kind of post draft like situational arguments about Kenneth Walker, and I kind of concluded that I'm a little bit lower on the Seattle landing spot than I initially was, just given the draft capital, because I do think Rashad Penny is like legitimate competition in that backfield, and I'm not super optimistic. Um, like, like I think pre-draft, I wasn't fully on board with like, okay, Kenneth Walker should be a good receiver in the NFL. Like, I, I think at at best, it's kind of we just don't know yet. And then in Seattle, like they didn't throw to the running backs much. The argument is okay, Russell Wilson's gone now, and he's a running quarterback, and so maybe they'll throw more. But like, they still didn't throw to the running backs when Geno Smith was the quarterback. Drew Locke didn't throw to his running backs much when Denver. So it's hard to it's hard to build like an upside case for Kenneth Walker being a three down back in this offense. I'd love to see it. Like we, we need, you know, an influx of talent here. Like the running back landscape in dynasty right now skews, you know, 26 years old. We need some, some young guys. And so I hope to see that. I just, I don't know. It's, it's tough. Um, another guy who went, uh, I believe he also went in the second round, maybe early third was Rashad white. Um, who, He's got the pass catching ability. He's a little bit bigger than Kenneth Walker is. And he was also a really efficient runner at Arizona State. But I've seen kind of mixed reviews on, especially from like film anal- analysts, about does he have like the nuanced skill set to run successfully between the tackles? And yeah, basically, I want your take on that. Like, do you view him as a threat to Leonard Fournette? Is this kind of a 1A, 1B thing? How do, how do you view this shaking out in Tampa Bay? I don't see him as a threat to Leonard Fournette at all. In fact, I think it was strictly like, hey, we got to upgrade on Ronald Jones. We got to update, upgrade on Keyshawn Vaughn and just get it back that, you know, we're going to feel good about catching the ball out of the backfield. The, fr- the fact of the matter is, I mean, the Bucks gave Leonard Fournette a long term commitment. They gave him a little more money than maybe they needed to. They love Leonard Fournette. Uh, I think Rashad White is going to be a, a fantastic backup for him. Uh, and if Leonard Fournette goes down, White can certainly be a bell cow. But that being said, I don't think Rashad White has uh, the vision and processing to be an inside runner from day one. Like Kenneth Walker, you could drop Kenneth Walker in any single, all for any 32 team right now, give him 18 carries and he would do well. I don't feel that way. It's like the complete opposite with Rashad White. A lot of his runs at Arizona State, a lot of his best runs were through just massive holes. Uh, There's far too many times where he would run at the back of his offensive lineman. Um, yeah, inside inside vision and kind of just like footwork is a it's going to be a big thing for him. And I think you know, waiting a couple of years maybe behind Leonard Fournette and he gets into you know an NFL uh, NFL offense where you know he can kind of just get the reps, you know, build his body a little differently. I think that's in the cards for him. But right now, not really. Uh, but as a pass catcher, yeah, man. I mean, you could put him right up there with James Cooks and, and, and Tyler Beatty as the best ca- uh, pass catcher in this class. Um, he was number one, I believe, in yards per route run in this class. Really strong in missed tackles forced for reception, which I found has a, has a pretty big signal. Um, he was right behind uh, Damian Pierce uh, and Keontae Ingram in terms of missed tackles forced for reception, uh, right there with Bruce Hall. So yeah, I mean, you know, the passing down role, maybe he cards out, you know, passing down role. They brought back Gio Bernard though. Um, I don't see the. I've seen Rashad White get pushed up in like their late first, early yeah. second drafts, man. I, I'm not so sure I'm on that. I, I like a lot of the receivers uh, still better than White. Um, but by for landing spot, I mean, this is pretty much, you know, anything you could ask for. I don't think there's really a better landing spot for him other than like maybe Houston or Atlanta where he could get like immediate like Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I've I've all along kind of viewed the range of outcomes for White as like his absolute peak for these like athletic you know, maybe not super skilled, like pure runner types as like a, like David Johnson at his absolute peak. And then probably a more realistic outcome would be like Kenyon Drake, Tony Pollard, these like space backs with size who can catch passes, but are never really going to be the number one option for a team. Yeah. I think a comp, um, a great comp for him would be Kenyon Drake space back. Who's got some speed can catch it, but you do not want him running inside. Like, you yeah. don't want to be in the ball 12, 15 times a game trying to, you know, grind up yards. That's just not his game. And honestly, that's Leonard Fournette's game. You know, yeah. ironically, Leonard Fournette would be a home run hitter. 
it's kind of been the opposite. He's kind of just, you know, been a really good inside runner who's developed into a really good pass catcher. Yeah, for sure. Um, another guy who, you know, maybe he can run inside, maybe he's just a space back, is James Cook, who landed in seemingly a really good spot in Buffalo, probably the best pass catching back in this class. Do you view him as having, like, some sort of lead back type, you know, something like workhorse level upside here? Do you think he's more just a, a supercharged satellite back? How do you feel about him and his landing spot in Buffalo? I love that phrase, supercharged satellite. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly what James Cook is. Uh, he's just too small, uh, unfortunately. You know, he's 195, but uh, honestly, he looks like he's built like he's 180. Really, really small in the lower half. But that being said, I mean, the dude is an incredible athlete. It showed on tape. I mean, you know, he split carries with Zamir White, who did you know, pretty much all like the dirty work inside stuff. But you know, James Cook was second in his class in yards created per attempt. Um, obviously, a very good pass catcher. Uh, he ran, I, I think it was like 20, 22% of his routes. He ran like split out as an actual wide receiver in the slot. And he got separation on him. Uh, you know, even when he didn't get the ball, I mean, he was getting separation um, even when the play wasn't designed to his side. So, I, you know, I think the Bills have been looking for a back like James Cook where they can kind of use him as a mismatch chess piece, give him some screens, give him some swings, but also kind of split him out and give them more personnel to spread the field for Allen. Uh, I think that's what they wanted Jay McKissick to be, and I think that's why they drafted James Cook so early. He's the problem, man. Is he's just so small. Like he's just not a guy you're gonna want to be getting the ball in like short yardage situations or red zone situations because, you know, he's extremely competitive, but he just he just doesn't have the power in his legs, you know, to drive through 260 pound linebacker in short yardage. Situation. That's gonna what's ultimately gonna cap him for our game. Yeah. Yeah. Um... It's, we've just been burned so many times by like these small guys who seem like they're going to be good, and then NFL coaches just don't use them like we would if we were playing Madden. So it's, it's tough to fully buy in. Um, recently, maybe in the last, like I don't know, five years, ten years, there's a lot of research about the replaceability of running backs, the relative lack of importance of the running game relative to the passing game, um, the relative seeming lack of importance of the ball carrier in determining the outcome of a given run play relative to like the offensive line and the play call and things like that, that have given rise to this, this running backs don't matter movement or theory. Um, do you buy into this? Um, where do you stand? And like, how does that that concept sort of inform your evaluations of running backs, your projections for them for fantasy, if at all. So to me for fantasy, it's, it's kind of like not even really a conversation at the end of the day, we're looking for volume for fantasy. So this, to me, this is more of like just an NFL, how you want to build your team structural type of, type of idea. And I guess I'll start here saying running the ball doesn't matter and saying running backs are replaceable are two totally separate totally separate things uh, to say running the ball in the NFL doesn't matter is in my opinion uh, an extremely uh, it's an argument that lacks a lot of context absolutely passing the ball is way more valuable than running on a per play basis this is the, like this has been proven since 2015 yeah uh, you, you can take it as far as like EPA per play or you can just look at yards per play I mean, it's very, very obvious that passing is way more efficient uh, than, than running the ball. But if you talk to coaches, if you talk to players, if you talk especially to offensive linemen, they say running the ball sets the tone. That there's an actionable, um, there's an actionable point here to, to running the ball that maybe data doesn't capture. And I'm as data driven as anybody. I, I don't make a decision whether it's. DFS, whether it's investing, whether it's betting without looking at the data. But I also understand that there's a lot of nuance and context in some of this data that we're looking at in football that's being completely missed. Running the ball absolutely matters. Uh, and if you try to, you know, run a play action, if you're running play action heavily and you're, you're not running the ball at all, um, you know, that play action play, that sixth, seventh, eighth time you run it, that defense is going to start keying on that. So there's a lot of little things that I think a that you know, some of the strictly data-based arguments aren't picking up on. That being said, you know, as it relates it back to running back skill, yeah, I mean, you can find 25 running backs that are pretty good inside runners, and there's very, very little margin between them. 
the big difference is when you get somebody like Jonathan Taylor, you get somebody like Derrick Henry, those guys do make a difference. And if you look at the numbers in terms of next-gen stats, rushing yards over expectation, you look at uh, any of the, some of these advanced numbers, EPA per attempt, uh, and then you filter it down by inside carries or down in distance and start kind of measuring it from that perspective and giving it more context, then yeah, absolutely. There's certainly, there's certainly five to six guys that are way more valuable running the ball inside and say, you know, what happens when you give Ronald Jones a start? <laughs> you know, a start yeah. Ball. So, you know, it's just, I, I think uh, a lot, it, it's frustrating. I, I try to stay out of a lot of it um, because I think a lot of the arguments become way too binary and just like hot takey. Yeah. Uh, to the point, where the context is just like completely gone. It's like how can I, how can I uh, be as pompous as possible? <laughs> not helpful. Not helpful right. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, at the core of it, you know, saying running backs don't matter and saying running the ball doesn't matter are, are, are two totally separate things. And I just think anybody that that comes out and says, "Hey, let's throw the ball eighty-five percent of the time and we'll never run it," like. Good luck in the in the modern NFL. Seriously, good good luck. Yeah. Set the cup and have balance on offense. Um, yeah, I know that was a super long winded answer, but no, you're good. Probably, I'm, I'm really passionate. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the the initial point you made about kind of fantasy football, we're just looking for volume. Um, I don't know that that conclusion was reached by you or by the greater community through the lens of like running backs don't matter. But I also think there's a certain element of that to that conclusion where like we know that Damian Williams could step in to what, or, you know, CJ Anderson and Todd Gurley with the Rams, like. Todd Gurley went down, C.J. Anderson came in and was just as efficient, just as good. And we know that Todd Gurley's better, but we have these kind of, you know, base level understandings of how football works. And we know that the guys who are going to, you know, get work are going to get fantasy points. And so I think that kind of um, speaks to, you know, kind of the relationship between these things. Yeah, man, like, um, I I think you're you're definitely on to something in the sense of like, you know, we've seen backs go down like Le'Veon Bell when Le'Veon Bell went down D'Angelo Williams came in and you know six seven eight games I mean he basically replicated what Love Bell did and you know obviously we know the, the end result I mean that was kind of like the end of Love Bell I mean, yeah gone from years he got paid good for him and then Connor stepped in and replicated him again yeah 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 I mean he got the bag good for him but yeah I mean we've, we've definitely seen instances before um but most of the time when we're having these arguments, we don't have a sample size where it's D'Angelo Williams versus Le'Veon Bell. We have like one or two games. Right. And I think drawing meaningful conclusions, especially in a, in a sport like football where, man, maybe those one or two games, like they played an awful run defense, like bottom five run defense, and he just went off because their offensive line had a good game. Or, hey, maybe they were trailing in this game and he got six or seven targets when we were only expecting two or three. Um, there's just a lot of context that in a lot of these arguments, in my opinion, that's just been completely, uh, being completely messed. Yeah, and I think there's probably some value, too, to – NFL coaches are are better at game planning and scheming and calling plays that accommodate the skill sets of their players that we give them credit for and the kinds of, you know, runs and play calling decisions that you're going to make with D'Angelo Williams, you know, a 30 year old D'Angelo Williams that as your lead back are different than you would make with 25 year old Le'Veon Bell. And though you, you might have the same efficiency on those running plays that that's, you know, a different dynamic to your offense that you've lost with Le'Veon Bell. And let's be honest. I mean, D'Angelo Williams was a fantastic running back. For yeah. I mean, and Stewart, that was an awesome duo. Like he never truly, he never truly broke out. If you want to say because Jonathan Stewart was a great back too, but like, let's not like it, this isn't some just like you know it's not like we're pulling off you know some fourth string off the street. Like D'Angelo Williams was a very good player at that time. Um, yeah, man. I, I think I think the debate is we could do a two three hour long podcast on this whole debate. You know, not encapsulated in a twenty-minute conversation, but yeah, I, I, you know, studying these backs for the last seven years, it's it's honestly taken me even further to like, sure, running the ball in the NFL is definitely less valuable than passing, but to say running the ball doesn't matter or running backs in general don't matter, like I've, I don't know, I just think that's an extremely lazy argument. Yeah, and I, I really think it's a lot of it has to do with just the threshold for reaching the NFL as a running back. All of these guys, like we touched on this a little bit before, all of these guys are just so good that Jonathan, 
Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. He, he might be the one guy who goes in and fucks things up, but everybody else can, you know, do a good enough job to get five yards of carry, four yards of carry. So um, let's pivot back to running backs, uh, uh, rookie running backs. Pretty much everybody I see, um, even, even the, like, data guys are on board now. Like, the pure data guys are on board now with Damien Pierce having been, like, criminally underutilized at Florida. Um, he got day three capital, but early day three, which is decent, to a wide-open depth chart in Houston. How do you view his skill set? Are you excited about him in fantasy? Uh, talk to me a little bit about Damien Pierce. Yeah, Damien Pierce was my guy pre-draft. Uh, he's third in this class in yards created per attempt. Second. In this top was forced for attempts. And you mentioned it, man. I mean, you know, he just was not, he was not used enough. Uh, I mean, it was just bizarre. I mean, he would, you know, rip off an 8, 10, 12 yarder and then literally not get the ball again for, you know, another quarter and a half. I can't really speak to why Dan Mullins and his staff did that, but I do know there's a reason why Dan Mullins got fired 11 months after making the NFL championship and also giving Alabama a run for the money. If you remember that game was close up until like the end of the fourth quarter of the SEC championship. So Florida was sick of him either through maybe bad recruiting or poor game management, whatever the case was. Like you know, they asked him for a reason, and you know we've been burned plenty of times by these like small sample efficiency guys who have very very limited career production. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, I mean, you know, Damian Pierce's efficiency is like elite elite uh, on you know his. Uh, on his limited uh, touches. Uh, he's third in this class in yards per out run. He's strong in missed tackles force per reception. Like any any data point you want to look at, efficiency-wise, he was really strong in. But, you know, relating it back to landing spot and the Texans and stuff, like, yeah, we still, we've never seen Damian Pierce, you know, be able to handle, you know, five carries and eight plays. We, we haven't seen that. Uh, yeah. I, I think, you know, Marlon coming off of popped Achilles and Rex Burkhead being, you know, what, 29 now is, is definitely not a lot of competition. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, the Texans rotated backs grossly last year. I wouldn't be shocked if they rotated backs again this year and maybe Damian Pierce steps up and he's the lead. And it's like, all right, you know, it's clear this guy's better than everybody else in our depth chart. But yeah, I, I'm as bullish as anybody on Damian Pierce, but I also recognize that, you know, there's been plenty of guys we've been burned by in the past that have his profile. And, um, you know, he, he's by no means going to just be gifted that job as an early fourth round pick over Mack and, and Rex Burkhead. Yeah, for sure. How do you, uh, please, please just tell me that you're in on Keontae Ingram in Arizona as at least like an interesting guy in a backfield with like an older lead back in Connor and a guy we don't really know if he's any good in Eno Benjamin. Dude, I, uh, I, I charted Keontae Ingram and a couple other guys after the draft just cause I, uh, you know, wanted to go back and watch him. Um, he's really good. Oh, hell Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just in terms of data, like, um, you know, this is this is a pretty weak class overall. There's a lot of, like, bottom 20th percentile guys. Um, yeah, Keontae is, is interesting for sure. Um, he's kind of got this, like, slashing. You don't really see a lot of, like, slashers like him uh, anymore. You, you see a lot of, like, you know, Brees Hall's kind of got this, like, He's got he's a little bit of a slasher, but he's more fluid. You know, Keontae Ingram's not this like it's extremely sudden athlete, but uh four point four five yards created per attempt, um, which is just right behind Damian Pierce for fourth best in this class. Uh a pretty strong receiver. Uh I, I kind of felt like they underutilized him in that aspect at USC. Um yeah, man, I, I think Ingram's real interesting and like you said, I mean that depth chart, I, I don't think, you know, Benjamin's really a threat. He's just so small and it's just not not a very good player. He's really poor in yards created, and it doesn't surprise me he hasn't been able to go on the field. I think Keontae Ingram has, you know, as far as six-round picks go, uh, Keontae Ingram has, you know, some of the best opportunity to, to earn snaps uh, out, of this, out of this group. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think as far as six-round picks go, he's probably one of the more talented you know, we, we have to take draft capital into account, but you also got to take into, like, how talented do we think these, go are, these guys are in the context of the draft capital that they got. And I think Keontae Ingram's better than most sixth-round picks. So I am also pretty excited about him in Arizona. How do you feel about Tyrion Davis-Price um, as a player? Um, he was, you know, decent as the lead back at LSU the last couple of years. Um, did he chart well in yards created? 
how you know who who knows what's going to happen in San Francisco every year with their running backs? Were you an Elijah Mitchell guy? How how do you view this falling out? Yeah, um, uh, my notes on Davis Price like he's a no nonsense north south guy. He's got this like you know one little like jump cut move that like works. <laughs> he's not louder of that all like at all, and I wouldn't call him sudden either. Um, I think his footwork for a back of his size is really good though. And it's kind of easy to understand like why Shanahan might like him for his, for his zone scheme. You know, he's just kind of like, all right, you're going to make your one cut. You're going to you know, just eat up your yards and just get up North and South. Uh, as for like theory behind the pick, like I'm always interested to see what backs Kyle Shanahan likes. Um, he's obviously hit some home runs. Uh, he's hit some complete, uh, well, I guess not hit. He's just struck out on three <laughs> pitches. You know, Williams. He struck out with Trey Sermon trading up for him. Uh, it's definitely been a mixed bag. But he also drafted Elijah Mitchell in the fifth round. Uh, I think the pick is really interesting. Then I, I think it signals that two things: one, they don't want Elijah Mitchell to be a bell cow. Like he broke down when he was getting twenty to twenty-five carries per game, and that's not a slight against Mitchell whatsoever. I mean, I think being a and this goes back to our conversation about running backs and if they matter or not. Being a bell cow and being able to stay on the field and get 20 carries and five targets every game and stay healthy is a skill. And it's a valuable one too, because it allows you to be, hey, we've got this one back on the field. We're not tipping our hand by any means. Uh, we, you don't know if it's going to be a run. You don't know if it's going to be a pass. We've seen teams like the Patriots completely tip their hand. Like when, you know, Damian Harris is on the field, it's probably going to be a run. But when James White's on the field, it's probably not going to be. That is absolutely a skill in the context of the building and in offense but Terry Davis Price like if he's on the field it's going to be a run yeah he can't, he's not a pass catcher right uh, I, think, I think you know it signals to me that Elijah Mitchell is not going to be a bell cow and maybe Debo Samuel's running back role is just a one one year thing they just need somebody else who can kind of be a hammer in short yardage because in that Packers game man Debo was their short yardage back mm -hmm. you know going back, you're watching that game like third downs red zone like he was their short yardage back by the end of the year I think Terry Davis Price can be that guy. Yeah, he he just feels like a classic 49ers pick from the last couple of years. He's you know, he's he's not Raheem Mostert fast, but he's got speed. He's, you know, a little thin at like six foot two ten, so he just he just feels like a guy that they would have liked. Um you, you touched on the New England backfield a little bit. Um they took two running backs, Pierre Strong and then Kevin Harris. Do you like either of those guys? Do you think either of them have a shot at like cracking this rotation? How do you feel about the Patriots' backfield? Dude, they, they've got five guys now. Uh, they brought James White back on a one-year deal. He might he might not make the team, though. Uh, yeah. The medical scene. So, yeah, they're going to go, f I guess, four deep with Dame, Stevenson, Strong, and, and maybe Kevin Harris. Uh, one of those guys probably aren't. They're probably not going to make this team. But uh, I didn't watch Kevin Harris, um, but I did watch Pierre Strong. Uh, he was a guy who got some buzz, and I was like, "Oh man, um, you know, small, school, you know, small school back, Mountain Valley, like crushed in, you know, basically. I mean, he had like 1,600 rushing yards last year. Nobody else in the Mountain Valley had like more than 800. Uh, so production was there. Efficiency was really bad, though, man. Um, okay. I haven't. What's that? I said okay. That's that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, I have not seen a running back go down on first contact more than Pierre Strong has ever. Wow. Um, for a guy of his size, he has like virtually no run power, uh, which is really unfortunate. He's very, very fast in a straight line. You give him a, a wide open lane and he looks like freaking JT out there. But uh, just in terms of his run, his run power, his contact balance, is just not at the NFL, it's just not at the NFL level. And I was really surprised that the Patriots took him because they're all about like yards after contact, running through, running through contact. Maybe they view Pierre Strong as like a, a you know a souped up you know pass catching back who's got some juice because Pierre Strong's a, he's a pretty good pass catcher. But yeah, in terms of just like getting volume at the NFL level, I, I unless he turns into another a, a different player than what we saw his last college i'd be surprised if he got anything more than like a couple carries per game especially considering damon harris and, and ramon de street and center i think by far and away way better prospects than strong ones yeah yeah i think so and the just better 
between the tackles you know they can they can do that stuff i think strong just kind of adds an element to that offense that they especially if james white is gone and even with him like strong's just so much more dynamic out in space that maybe that maybe they see something there who knows um okay this is a sort of a different question i guess um if you so you have your your like day-to-day duties in your job you know you got to put out whatever content you're putting out and you know whatever your responsibilities are if you had a month off paid you got a research grant whatever and you could just dive into some sort of topic or idea football related to answer some sort of question that you have or or just what whatever it is like what is the thing that you would want to sort of research and find an answer to that you just don't have time or resources to do given your responsibilities that is a great question um i i think and, you know, we, I, I started doing, I started working in fantasy in 2015, 2016, was full time in 16. And I've just seen like an explosion of, and it's been great to see PFF's been definitely at the forefront of, of this. There's just an explosion of just kind of like data analysis. And uh, now we've gotten to a point where it's like oversaturated, uh, in my opinion, where people are just kind of like taking these data points that have no signal whatsoever. And, um, and just applying just like broad strokes to them. One thing I, I don't think we do a good enough job of in the analytics space is determining how wide receivers get open. I think Matt Harmon does a great job with reception perception, but I think he even tell you that there's a lot of context that, that you know he could be picking up on that isn't out there. I would love, you know, next gen stat has like a yards of separation stat that's, you know, in theory good, but even the next gen guys will tell you it's sketchy at best <laughs> in the, the way they are recording it so to answer your question yeah i think i think finding a way to like better encapsulate um receiver separation it's such a humongous part of the game now especially when the margins are so thin these corners are longer faster um i think really diving deep into receiver separation and just trying to quantify that better uh, like i said reception perception does a, a really good job of it um, but yeah, this is something that I, I've talked to Scott Baird about this a lot too. Is like this is like the holy grail. Is if we can find a way to better encapsulate yards of separation, we, we, you know, I think that's the holy grail for receiver stats, honestly. And you can split it out by any number of things. You know, are they good against zone? How are they against man? You know, how are they on, on go routes? How are they on five yard slants, eight yard slants? Um, that's that's the question I'd love to answer, and I. I'm not nearly smart enough and I don't have nearly enough charting prowess to do it, but uh, it's definitely a question that I'd love to see, love to see answered in the near future with this kind of like, you know, big analytics push that we've got going on in football, which has been awesome to see. Yeah, I, I, I like that answer. I think um, the, the kind of example in this draft class that comes to mind is like the the Drake London profile where there's these people who are like he he doesn't separate but then you've got other people who are he does separate he just does it at the top of the route you know at at the catch point and i think that's a that's a compelling point it would just be nice to see like who are other players who separated in that way how do we quantify at which point in the route or on the stem or at the catch point that they are you know separating so yeah i think that's a that's a great question to look into yeah, I mean, it goes back to my kind of nexus for yards created. It's like, okay, you know, you say this guy doesn't get anything beyond what his offensive line blocks from. Great, that's fine. How are we going to quantify that? It's like the Drake London example is the exact example I've had in my mind, too. It's like you hear anybody at ESPN or NFL Network say, well, Drake London doesn't create separation. Okay, how are you quantifying that? Like, I, I think one thing I've been thinking about is like, when you listen to a film analyst, they have watched hours and hours and hours and hours. They have like a film like computer in their head and they're really just trying to like draw conclusions to like, hey, I know this worked for this player. This guy has a similar body type to this player. Vis-a-vis, Drake London is Mike Evans. Mm-hmm. And you know, that, that to me is still really valuable because it's like, okay, yeah, Mike Evans isn't, you know, he's not Odell Beckham. He's not prime Odell Beckham where he's just shaking corners, but he still has that big body, that big frame and can score a lot of touchdowns. And for fantasy, that's what matters most. But yeah, like, you know, I still, we still hear it all the time. Drake London is in the separator. Okay, but how are we quantifying that? Like, like 
we got to find some way to put some context and some sort of measurable behind it. Uh, because otherwise, like, maybe Joy Klein is way better at creating separation than everyone else says he is. And it's just kind of like a total misnomer. Like, yeah, I would, lo- would love somebody to, to really break some ground there because there's there's so much ground to be broken. For sure, for sure. Okay, good answer. That was, I, I like it. Let's get back to rookies. Uh, there were a couple of two down, maybe maybe they're plotters, maybe they're just two down grinders, whatever, whatever you want to say. Who do you view as your preferred handcuff behind a fragile, coming off of injury, lead back between Snoop Connor in Jacksonville behind Travis Etienne and Hassan Haskins behind Derrick Henry in Tennessee? Well, are we sure Snoop Connor's the... The backup? I mean, I know James Robinson popped his Achilles. Mm-hmm. So he's there, but I don't know, man. I, I, don't, I don't think Snoop Connor's like a guaranteed even make that roster. You know? Okay. Do you do you like Raquel Armstead? Yeah. I mean, they brought... Dude, Armstead had a really bad case of COVID, and they brought him back at the end of last year. He he was in the hospital for like months. Mm-hmm. Almost a career. Um, they brought him back... You know he'll compete for that third role. I, I don't think I don't think Steve Connors is guaranteed to make that team. But yeah, so I'd go Hassan Haskins. Um, you watch five minutes of Hassan Haskins, you'll get it. <laughs> uh, dude, big body thumper. Like uh, he benefited from a great Michigan offensive line for sure. Uh, second percentile in yards created per attempt. He was right down there with like Samir White. Um, but yeah, I mean if if um, you know Derrick Henry goes down, I wouldn't be surprised if Haskins could come in and have 15, 18 carries. Uh, but he's you're you're not going to replicate the the, the Derrick Henry. I mean, yeah. One. So for this question, yeah, I'll go Haskins. How do you feel about uh, Tyler Algier in Atlanta? Um, was he kind of a uh fraudulent at BYU? Did he look good on yards created? Um, can he step in and be useful for fantasy this year on like a pretty weak depth chart? Uh, I would say he was meh for yards created. Not terrible. In the context of this class, he looks a little better. Uh, 4.23 yards created per attempt was above Jerome Ford, Pierre Strong, Tyler Beatty, Brian Robinson, so uh, Kyron Williams too. Um, so in the context of the class, he was like right smack dab in the middle. Um, but he's another guy. He's like just like Hassan Haskins. Like you, you turn on one game and like you're like, all right, you know, go. If you haven't watched Tyler Algier, go watch his game against Utah. And you'll get it. Like he's gonna exact. He's going to get what the offensive line blocks from every single time. Uh, whether or not he gets anything beyond that is, is another question. Uh, was not extremely elusive. Was not really fast. Uh, he like toes the line of like plotter, but. You know, in that offense, we know what they're going to want to do this year. They're going to want to run a lot of RPOs. They're going to run a lot of zone reads. And, hey, maybe, you know, with Mariota or maybe Devin Ritter kind of stretching the boundary, you can get Algier going north-south, and maybe he's a really good fit in that scheme. They don't have a north-south guy. You know, CPAT is not that guy. You know, he's a, he's a fun player, and it was great to see, you know, Arthur Smith kind of unlock his talent. But they needed a bigger back, and I think Tyler Algier, Algier makes some sense for them. Um, but that being said, like plotters on really bad offenses just just don't really get it moving for fantasy for me. So I, I've kind of I haven't moved Tyler Algier up or down my ranks. I think I'm RB <laughs> seven pre draft. I'm having that RB seven now. Okay, yeah, I think I don't remember where I ended up having it, but I, it's right in that range. So um, the question that everybody wants to know is how good was Kenneth Dixon at Louisiana Tech? And were we just wrong on him? Did the off the field stuff ruin him? What what happened with Kenneth Dixon, and why wasn't he good in the NFL? Yeah, this is this is the whole show right here. Yeah, the, the whole show on Kenny Dixon. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was like my first. Um, he came on that 2016 class. Him and CJ Procise were like my two guys in that class uh, that I, I loved. Dixon's offensive line at uh, in college was still the worst I've ever charted. I mean, the dude just like constantly got attacked behind the line. Of uh, I have no idea. I, you know, I wish I knew. Um, maybe it was the off-field off-field stuff, but um, as a prospect, I mean, Dixon Dixon was pretty strong. Yeah, I, I I will never let go of the idea that Kenneth Dixon 
could have had the career that Kareem Hunt had. You know, just the situational things shook out differently for the two of them. I think we'll never know. Um, but speaking of Kareem Hunt, what do we think happens in this Kansas City backfield? Do we want to roster Edward Zulaire? Do we want to roster Ronald Jones? Do we want to just leave it alone? Yeah, I've gone back and forth on this uh, really since they signed Rojo. Uh, to be honest with you, the role that Rojo might be in is like perfect for him. You know, you kind of get him in that like change of pace goal line role. Um, man, I think this this backfield could be real gross this year, man. Like, like you know, Clyde plays on some passing downs and third downs, long distance. You know, you get Rojo in there on early downs and goal line stuff. Like, I don't know. I'm gonna take some cheap shots on 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 both of these guys in, in best ball, um, and then kind of make a call on season long and you know, really maybe just stake a claim on one guy in August when I start doing season long stuff from our, you know, uh, waiver teams. But right now I, I really don't have a preference. Um, and honestly, where these guys are going in the best ball drafts right now, I'm, I'm mostly focused on, on the receivers and kind of like the seventh to 11th round pocket, uh, just the way I'm building my teams. But yeah, it, it's, it's gross, man. Everything comes full circle. <laughs> Everybody, everyone loved Ronald Jones, um, in my opinion, for the wrong reasons, and everybody, you know, liked Clyde edwards alaire for the right reasons. It just hasn't worked out. Yeah. Now they're the same backfield, and yeah, it's just I have a feeling it's going to be pretty gross. Yeah, but yeah, I'm with you. Um, in in preparing for this for this show for this interview, I, I dug pretty deep, and in your yards created notebook for the 2019 class. You wrote that David Montgomery looks like a featured back, but he can't live off contact balance forever. He turns 25 this summer. He's coming off the least healthy and arguably the least effective season of his career. Is 2022 the year that the wheels fall off for David Montgomery? You know, his rookie season um, was like the everything I saw we saw in college at uh, Iowa State. You know, he was really good through contact but I think he struggled to kind of like have enough burst inside of like two to five yards to really make a difference. And then second year, uh, he looked a lot quicker to me. He's been a lot quicker since then. I think he's worked on a lot on his agility and it shows up, you know, it shows up, you know, both in terms of the numbers and on tape. Um, I like David Montgomery this year, man. I think, I think this is the first year uh, maybe in his career for fantasy where I've been like, not all in, but really, really uh, interested in his price. Uh, like you mentioned, he's coming off the injury, but man, they didn't do anything. They, they had yeah. nothing. I mean, they got Cleo Herbert, who was fine in a couple games, but you know, he's still a backup. Uh, I think Montgomery is going to get that bell cow roll again. I think they're they're going to keep throwing him the ball because, frankly, they kind of have to just based on their receiver depth chart. Um, like you mentioned, twenty five. He's still in that prime range. For Dynasty is a different question. I would probably be selling, but for this year, um, yeah, I, I like David Montgomery. It's probably the cheapest bell cow on board. Okay, uh, there were there were a lot of these guys, uh, a lot of these guys in this class who had profiles. As far as I can tell, they were at least as good as some of the guys who went drafted. But these guys went undrafted. Um, I'm talking about like the the Kennedy Brooks, Abram Smith, Zaquandre White type guys. Um, have you charted any of these guys? Do you do you like the spots they landed in? I think. Kennedy Brooks and Abram Smith look like they could have some early opportunity. Are you are you interested in any of these these undrafted running backs? Yeah, haven't charted uh, either Kennedy Brooks or Abram Smith. I know Kennedy Brooks fell because of off field stuff. Oh, um, yeah, he's got some off field stuff. Um, you can Google. Um, yeah, um, Abram Smith is interesting though because the Saints depth chart is so bad. Um, I thought they would. I, they brought in Sony Michelle for a visit. I thought they might sign hmm. him. Um, Camara is going to get suspended. I think it might be just like two games, but uh, I think he's going to get suspended. Mark Ingram's kind of, I mean, he's on his last leg. Yeah. He, he looked pretty, he looked pretty toast uh, at the end of uh, last year when he got a couple starts. Um, so yeah, in terms of opportunity, I think Abram Smith is probably the most interesting UDFA. Um, but you know, this is, this kind of relates it back to our running backs don't matter uh, arguments. Like, Oh, you can just go out there and sign Philip Lindsay. You can sign James <laughs> Robinson. For every Philip Lindsay and James Robinson, there's a Zacondre White. There's a um, who's the who? Who's the guy that um, 
Atlantic signed two UDFAs last year. Neither made the team. Uh, uh, Javian Hawkins. Javian Hawkins, yeah, yeah. Like, there's like yeah. a million Hawkins. Yeah. I mean, like, for every every UDFA success story that you point out, like Austin Eckler, there's ten guys. Oh yeah. That never made. I mean, it's 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 crazy. So, I think is in terms of opportunity, Abram Smith's probably at the top of, of the UDFA list, and you know, you just gotta understand that you're taking like it's like. Chance. yeah for sure and he he was good at baylor last year and he he played defense early in his career and so i think he has some of that like marginal utility to where like that that helps him make the team you know if he can contribute on special teams or whatever so yeah he, there's a lot of linebacker former linebackers tyler algier was a former linebacker i think Smith was a linebacker too. yeah zaquandre white at florida yeah. state as well so um, how do you feel about uh, Jerome Ford? He was kind of a kind of an interesting guy. A lot of people were fans. Um, I've kind of landed on like a, a Tevin Coleman type comp for him. Is just sort of like general straight line speed. Maybe can catch the ball a little bit. How do you feel about Jerome Ford? Do you think he's got a chance to crack this pretty deep rotation in in Cleveland? Yeah, you know it is a deep rotation. Um, you know, Kareem Hunt. Will, this will probably be his last year in Cleveland. He was in the last year of his deal, so maybe they're you know banking for 2023, 2024 with Ford. But, um, I, you know, I kind of think him and Brian Robinson are very similar. Like, they both have good three-down skill sets, but kind of lackluster-ish profiles overall. Um, Ford's yards created per temp is in the eighth, uh, 22nd percentile all time. Uh, like you said, surprisingly good speed, but doesn't have a lot of, a lot of wiggle at all. Uh, I think he's like on that like Alexander Madison, James Connor, Wayne Gallman uh, talent spectrum. Where it's okay. Like, all right, these are really good backups, and you could or you know low end starter types uh, that you can feel good about for your run game, but not exactly somebody that you want to you know build around long term. But um, yeah, it was interesting. I mean, Dearness Johnson was really good last year. Right? Yeah. Uh, let's start. You know, the, the Ford pick was was certainly interesting you know now they've got four guys one of these guys is going to get cut yeah i, I don't think we're back. yeah i've seen speculation that kareem hunt could be like a cap casualty or something just given how even before the ford pick just given how well dearness johnson played um so i don't know maybe that still happens maybe it's kind of too far gone at this point who knows but um another question i wanted to ask is not related to these rookies but just kind of thinking back to like when you were a kid starting to get into football, who is there like one guy who was like your favorite running back, a couple different guys that you just remember love watching growing up? Who are those guys? Runner is Marshall Falk. Uh, I, I was born in 94, so the, the greatest show on turf was like, you know, my childhood, six, seven years old. Uh, Marshall Falk for sure, just because he kind of revolutionized the position as a pass catcher and an explosive runner. Um, I, ca- I was obsessed with Barry Sanders. Um, I-, I would always watch like the old NFL films and stuff on Barry Sanders. So I-, I loved him. My favorite player of all time though is Randy Moss. Like Dante Culpepper and Randy Moss were uh, like my-, my guys coming out um, and when I was in- when I was a kid. Uh, Randy is just obviously the great, in my opinion, the greatest physical talent that the, the game's ever seen. Um, I, I wanted to name my little brother Dante after, after, <laughs> after my mom wasn't too hot on it, but she did like Walter Payton, uh, so we, we named my brother Payton. Nice. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Falk, um, obviously LT uh, in the, the early 2000s. Uh, weirdly, I love Mike Allstott. Like, he was like mm-hmm. a 208 fullback, but he just scored like 10, 12 touchdowns every year. Yeah. Yeah, I could I could talk about random early two thousand running backs for hours. <laughs> Heck yeah, yeah. I was a uh, I was a Packer fan. Well, I mean, I, I still am, but I, I was a Packer fan when I was a kid. So I remember when the the Randy Moss for Aaron Rodgers trade rumors were going on. I was all about it. Like, let's get Randy Moss and Brett Favre connected. I was a big Amon Green guy. So yeah, love Green. Amon Green was a sneaky good receiver. Oh yeah, cool. he's a really cool guy. I did a stream. Um, he was on. Did this thing with Joe Dolan, we were uh, the Hall of Fame League, and Amon Green was a part of it. And uh, he's like a big gamer. He's really, hmm. really cool. That's sick. Yeah, he had that one year with like eighteen hundred rushing yards and twenty touchdowns. Like it was, yeah. it was Priest Holmes and Amon Green as like the top fantasy backs. He was, yeah. he was, he was legit back in the day. Um, 
maybe maybe last question for you um how has the yards created process or your evaluation process in general changed from the time when you started through you know whatever kind of learning curve you had or mistakes you made um, how different is it from then to now to be honest with you the process of just watching the games hasn't changed at all i mean i'm still using the same exact you know charting uh, process that i did in 2016 I would say I'm much faster, <laughs> much, much faster at playing games, uh, just because I've seen tens of thousands of carries now. Uh, so I'm, I'm definitely gotten more efficient in that sense. Um, I think one thing, maybe one thing I haven't done a good enough job of, and this is just kind of like, you know, I, I have other responsibilities with, with fantasy points. You know, I really wish I could get to more rookies in earlier, uh, but just because I'm working in you know, January and February still on NFL stuff, it's really hard to, to chart more. So uh, I just wish I had some more time. Um, that's like the one wish I had is like, you know, I could get started on this in, you know, December, January, as opposed to late February, early March. But um, yeah, that's, that's like the one thing I, I wish I could change and, and, uh, and have a change for. Maybe I can in a couple of, uh, maybe this coming year I can, Know, kind of change my schedule around a little bit but yeah process has stayed the same exact same man um you know i think that's been important for me is like to have that consistency and i can be able to look and say hey in 2016 this guy was here and now we can kind of compare him to here and having that like historical balance um i think it's important yeah that's good that means you, you struck on something that worked early on you didn't didn't have to change it, so that's good. I'll I'll sneak one more. Maybe it's a two part question. I don't know, but we'll we'll sneak one more in. Um, who are guys looking back? Um, maybe one of each who you were really high on, and then just he didn't turn out to be anything in the NFL. Maybe that was a lack of opportunity. Maybe he got opportunity and failed. And then who's a guy that you were just completely out on who has just proven you totally wrong since since the NFL. Yeah, um, at the top end, I'd probably say Anthony McFarland. Um, I always, you know, he was a home run hitter at, at Maryland, but he scored really well in yards created. Uh, he was like top six, top seven all time still. Uh, for, for just the process, you know, I always knew McFarland was, was probably not going to ever be like, a, you know, 18 to 20 carry guy. Um, but yeah, he was definitely a big, a big swing and miss. For sure. Then on the lower end of someone that I was, that yards credit was lower on, but you know probably didn't. Um, that did work. That's well, he's in the process of working out. He's AJ Dillon. Um, he basically just didn't catch passes at Boston College. But last year we saw like, man, you know, he's not just like a turnaround screen and then run off field kind of guy. Like he can run routes. Um, and I, I think he was. He's a lot better of an inside runner. Than I thought. I thought he was just like a big, heavy, slow plotter coming out of Boston College, but I, I think he's a lot more athletic than that, and he's a much better pass catcher than that. Yeah, he's been impressive. Yeah, especially from like a three-down perspective. He's yeah, you, like you said, he's not just catching swing passes. He's like a legitimate receiver at you know two forty, approaching two hundred fifty pounds. And 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 I, I I wasn't a big McFarland guy, but I'm surprised even just just given the weakness of that depth chart and how much they ran Najee Harris into the ground that they couldn't find a spot for this guy to just take a couple carries a game. Like, he's he, he's not a lead back, but he's, he's got a skill set that would be useful, I think. Yeah, yeah. I heard um, there, there was some motivation issues with him. Mm. So, yeah, I just, I think the coaches quickly, he got on the coach's bad side quickly, is my understanding. Okay, yeah, and there's an element of all this that we just, are not privy to going into the process that just makes it almost impossible so um man at the end of the day we're like looking through the tiniest little keyholes and you just got to make sure the keyhole you're looking for is you know there's some signal at the end of it yeah yeah i i thought of this analogy a while ago we're like trying to figure out how these guys are going to be is like if i closed my eyes and was like touching somebody's face and trying to like describe what they look like it's yeah. like you can get some things right like i can tell if they have a big nose or not but other than that i'm gonna be way off so it's tough but a great way to describe it for sure well i think uh i think i'll get you out of there on on that one uh i really appreciate you you know coming on this is a lot of fun um i have a lot of respect for your work um you know quantified film charting it's good stuff and so 
um, I think this, this is an interesting conversation for me at least. I think it's good content. So yeah, man, I, I appreciate you, you coming on, Graham. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. Uh, it was a good time for sure. Uh, we, could, we could maybe circle back and do a running backs don't matter show for, uh, for a later date. But yeah, this is good stuff. Yeah, hell yeah. Yeah, I would love that. <laughs>